Hello, everybody, and welcome to Enterprise Sales Development. I'm your host, Eric Quanstrom, the CMO at Science. Today's episode, we have Sarosh Khan. Sarosh is a vet. He's been in the sales development space for nearly a decade and a half. Um, some impressive gigs, too. In fact, he uh, was the director of North American sales development for 8x8, very familiar telecom brand, uh, director of global sales development for Commvault. Currently, he is leading SK Consultancy as essentially the founder CEO. So we dove into a, a multitude of topics. One of the places that I love that we started, though, was given his perspective, given his experience in the industry, we, we dove into what are the things about sales development in an ever-changing, fast, future tech world isn't changed or hasn't changed or won't change anytime in the near future. And he has some really insightful and interesting answers to that question. Uh, we talked a lot about, you know, kind of how to build and, and manage and ultimately inspire a sales development team towards success, something that Sarosh has seen quite a lot of, quite a lot of with his teams. Um, what makes for a really good SDR, um, especially we dove deep into kind of like storytelling aspects of the job. And you're going to want to listen to the entire interview because Sarosh drops a, a ton of really insightful kind of points of view and perspectives that I think are well worth your time. So without further ado, here he is, Sarosh Khan. And we're back with Sarosh Khan. Uh, Sarosh, it's really great to have you and someone that's been practicing kind of in the sales development space for a decade and a half almost. That's right. Thank you, Eric, for having me. And um, yeah, that's, that's absolutely right. Um, I started um, and, and, you know, it's funny, we refer to it as sales development. And I think that's a modern day term because, um, you know, I think Mark Benioff and Salesforce are, are credited with, with, the, with the title. But prior to that, it was, it was uh, referred to as an appointment coordinator um, and somebody who would just set appointments. And I'm pretty sure as far back as sales goes, there was always an appointment to be set. So, um, uh, but yeah, yeah, I definitely been doing it for the better part of 14 years. Um, and uh, most recently about six years in the B2B SaaS space and, and, and a ton has changed. So uh, definitely um, looking forward to discussing what those changes are, um, how they'll continue to persist and maybe even um, some things that seem to stay the same that people tend to forget about with all the influx of uh, technology. <laughs> Boy, isn't that the truth? You know, the, the phrase that is a little less sexy, but maybe even predates anything appointment related um, is just the garden variety term of prospecting, right? Like when it used to be full cycle or, you know, Renaissance sales um, people, and, and there's still a lot of field sales people that practice this. They think of prospecting as just kind of part of the sales job, the front end part, <laughs> you know, every single day. So there's, there's definitely parts of the sales world that have yet to change whatsoever. And I'd love to pick that thread up um, right there, which is what do you think is the most survivable aspects of prospecting that, are, that will probably never change, regardless of even kind of the trend lines that we're seeing now with AI, with specialization, with a lot of different ways to kind of view you know, what we've glamorized as sales development? Sure, that's, that's a great place to start. So, I mean, what's never, in at least in my opinion, going to change is the uh, component of being persistent. Yeah. And with so many different avenues of being able to get in touch with uh, the client, the prospect, the, the business, uh, people tend to forget it's those who are uh, utilizing these multiple different avenues uh, for their touch points through uh, modern day cadences, you know, cloud communications being at the forefront of that. Um, and uh, yeah, that's something that's never going to change. At the, at the end of the day, if you, if you strip all the technology and you remove all the other components, and even if you took email out of it, if, if you just gave a, a, a team a bunch of phone numbers and, co and contact information, the, the ones who are going to get ahead are the ones who have the highest volume of activity and touch points. Um, and of course, we're, we're, we have so many more advantages at, at our disposal now, but that part is never going to change. That's never going to, in my opinion, that'll always determine who's going to be a top performer on the team. Uh, it's going to set the cultural tone, obviously. Um, and it, 
in my opinion, it always needs to be the uh, point of emphasis, regardless of how great, and it is great, automation uh, can be. You know, it's funny you say that, because I think that if you were to invert that answer, um, the reason for persistence is because, you know, one single outreach, one and done is very low probability of success, isn't it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. The, the, the averages are um, at a, you know, changing on, at a five-year in, interval now. Um, in 2007, it took about four cold calls to get a, get a hold of a, of a prospect. Right now, it takes about eight touch points um, mm -hmm. be before you get a response. That's an average, of course. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, 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 that's definitely uh, the case. And that, that's been my experience, too. We're, we're also at a point in time where at least 50 percent, uh, and I think I'm being conservative with this number, but at least 50 percent of appointments are made through uh, not uh, through either the voicemail or an email. Um, so there there isn't actually even a live conversation that takes place. Um, you know, fifty percent of the time before before a discovery call is put in place, uh, and that's because people have you know they're not as prone to answering their phones anymore. Yeah. Um, there, there's so many different channels they can they can access um, uh, uh, infra, uh, communication from. We see tremendous variability um, in our company and and on behalf of a lot of different clients, depending on industry, depending on really the 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 ICP, the ideal customer profile chosen around which channels tend to dominate um, the appointment set. It's fascinating actually to watch, you know, the, the differences, if you will. One of the things that looking at those numbers, however, um, almost short changes, and I'd love to get your perspective on this, is multi-channel is, is also effective because the touches add up, because you're kind of being a mini marketer in your persistence in that um, I may not have necessarily called you back, but I did hear your voicemail. I may not have necessarily replied to your email, but when I got a phone call, all of a sudden I remembered your name. I may not have, you know, <laughs> visited your website. You know, all these channels, like they work in harmony together to create awareness, don't they? They, they absolutely do. And, you know, because of the um, multitude of, of channels that, that a, a rep has to get in touch, um, setting an appointment through a voicemail and an email is not as simple as just doing those two things. Um, you know, uh, social selling is huge now nowadays. Um, uh, obviously, uh, you know, doing the, the, the right amount of research prior to reaching out. But back in the day, at least when I started, I don't think there was a call center that had anybody making less than $150 a day. That, that just was the case. Now it's, you know, uh, research has come back with, you have to be more precise. I think that sweet number is now somewhere between that 40 and 50 range. Um, and, and I'm talking about, you know, the highest performing um, enterprise reps uh, uh, in terms of setting appointments. But going back to the voicemail and email component, it's, it's how many touch points did it get to even? Uh, uh, did it take to even get to that point? Um, and then prior to that, did you try to connect with them on LinkedIn? Um, what type of a message was sent? What was the type of research? It's still, you know, uh, the the reason I'm, I'm I'm going into detail for all the activity that's required before this is because um, the question that comes up quite often is is AI uh, going to eventually replace this? And I just um, don't see an an avenue where where AI can be nearly as as, as effective as a human being, uh, just because of that that human um, interaction and touch point that that takes place. Yeah, well, and I think a, maybe a, a more interesting lens to talk about is the way AI can actually help us be even more human or hyperhuman, if you will, um, in our work prospecting. Right? Can they? You you talked just a second ago about kind of like pre call research or understanding who your, your prospect is. Uh, AI is great at those types of activities and helping be an assistant or a mental prosthetic or you know, a Jiminy Cricket on our shoulder, uh, giving us kind of like information about the prospect that we're reaching out to in ways that really radically reduce the amount of time we would spend you know, kind of building that research manually, don't they? 
a hundred percent. I mean, um, the, the, the biggest, um, I think change, or at least the way that I ran the teams, you know, I, I know everybody has their own style, but for me, the, uh, you know, when you're hiring an SDR, they're going to do their due diligence and in, uh, in terms of their research on the product and then come in, but they're really not going to know the technology. Uh, it's, it's a preliminary level role. You're going to, your one of your objection handles is, is going to be most likely, okay, that's a little too technical for me. Let me get you to the right person. Yeah. Um, but with the AI, especially when it comes to those in-between emails where, where a prospect is like, no, can you do X, Y, and Z? Because that's that's the pain point. That's what I need um, uh, fixing. Um, instead of having to rush to an SE, your manager, you can just ask, um, you know, good old chat GPT or, 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 uh, or have that component of AI assist you. And I think from a sales enablement perspective, it's, it's going to really, really shape up uh, the speed at which um, uh, this whole function performs. So I, I definitely agree with that point. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and you had a couple of um, last few um, roles prior to opening your own consultancy where you were leading, you know, a significant amount of SDRs, right? Oh yeah, I had about, I was uh, at eight by eight, I was overseeing uh, about 30 internal and about an additional 25 uh, through a third party agency. Um, and this was across North America. And at Commvault, um, I was uh, overseeing roughly uh, 12 here in the Americas and, and about uh, eight um, in, in Europe. Uh, and then there was also a third party component. Um, so that lets you know which industry is a little bit more invested in the sales development program. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, yeah, uh, definitely um, uh, a large, large team and, and supporting the, the, the field sales reps. Well, I think an interesting place to take this discussion is, is kind of like the composition of large teams like that around a prospecting motion that's all feeding into roughly the same sales cycle um, is what you just shared about blending kind of in-house and outsource resources. And I'm, I'm really curious to know, A, your thoughts, your approach, your strategies. Um, did these kind of like grow organically or how, the, how you put those in place? And then B, like how you managed kind of like the swim lanes how you managed around um, who did what as far as prospecting was concerned? Sure, sure. So they definitely grew organically. Uh, when I joined 8x8, um, they had a, um, uh, an inbound and an outbound team. Um, and uh, initially, I believe the, the role reported into sales. And this is something I was hoping to discuss uh, on this call as well, because that's the ever, you know, that's that argument that's been going on forever. Is it better for, for that, for the team to report into marketing or into sales? And I have a lot of ideas there. I mean, it can work on both sides, but there's definitely major advantages for it to report into marketing. Um, but yeah, as far as um, when I joined 8x8, it, it, it moved under marketing and then um, we, we had an outbound and an inbound team. You know, we had a change in leadership, and all of a sudden, uh, I was tasked to grow the entire uh, North American team. I think we had a total of six or seven reps at the time. So um, uh, I reside here in New York City. We grew that team uh, to about um, about fifteen very quickly uh, to support uh, the the field reps, and we kept that ratio at a one to two. Um, okay. uh, one, one SDR supporting two, two AEs. Um, uh, eventually we opened up another team, uh, or, or um, uh, had another team support enterprise only out of California, um, which is where they were, had, they, they are headquartered. Um, and then another product line came into place as well. So there was a specific product focused, uh, team for, for contact center only, um, which was out of one of the satellite offices in, in Minneapolis. So, um, and during that time, there's at least three, if not more, I might be forgetting some third party vendors um, that I was working through. Um, initially, they were much smaller and um, it was really to test leads with. 
Um, one of the great ways to utilize a, a third party call center, meaning they're going to be running their, their own system, they're not going to be on your team meetings and things like that, other than providing training to the rep, you're just going to sort of have a hands off approach. What they um, really bring to the table is if you have maybe not the highest performing content syndication leads, whether you purchase them from a vendor or ran them through your own, you know, automation system like Marketo or something. Um, Great, great way to test the quality of those leads, what those conversations look like, because essentially those these type of uh, third party call centers are a dial for dollar sort of team. You, you don't have to worry too much about the research component there, which which also has its has its benefits. Um, but yeah, eventually um, uh, the uh, the head of marketing. Um, he he brought in a, in conjunction with the head of uh, sales, uh, they brought in a a large third party call center out of Florida. And they were now supporting the SDR function um, as well as small business. So the teams that I oversaw were specific to mid-market and enterprise, but, the, but, but those ones were overseeing um, uh, everybody. Um, and there was, uh, there was benefit there. Those guys didn't get any of the leads that, that, that we had internally. And I, I think that that's a, that's a very important um, uh, it's very important to, to not give your inbound leads to a third party call center because they're not around all the personnel that the SDR team members are. They don't hear the same conversations. They sure. just don't have that. You know, another um, uh, trend that I noticed in, in, in the industry and it hasn't changed. It, for whatever reason, this trend hasn't changed. The least qualified reps always seem to ha have the responsibility of qualifying the hottest leads. I, I, I <laughs> for the life of me, I don't understand what the reason for that is, but you can fumble away really good opportunities if you keep that system in place. Um, so, it, you know, if, if it comes down to it being a commissions issue or anything like that, you can always alter and, and you know, have granularity in there, uh, which can decipher between, you know, easier, opportunities than ones that, that take more effort. But, um, but yeah, that, that was sort of my approach. Um, reporting into marketing, um, it's, it's, it's so important to have um, a pipeline as that's the deciding metric for every other department, whether it's demand generation or uh, the digital team. Um, and, and, you know, you get to work with them very closely. Of course, I'm tied to the hip with sales because essentially that's the determining factor for what's what's working and what's not. But um, uh, over the years, and this is what where I had to grow as a leader. We we rang the bell and we you know celebrated our pipeline numbers, and then sales didn't hit their number. And that's the first time I looked at the pipeline and 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 tried to understand how on earth are we going to. We can celebrate all we want. If the company isn't making any money, it doesn't matter at the end of the day. Um, so that's where I think, uh, you know, a succinct commission plan comes into place where a closed one component can be in, uh, can take place. You can put that in the MBOs for, you know, all parties involved. And it doesn't have to be a big component of it. But you, but you have, if you're not at 25% in the enterprise B2B SaaS space, as far as your close rates, your pipeline doesn't really, it's not, it's not best in class. Let's just put it right. That way. Um, yeah, you know, it's funny. I can relate um, very strongly as a, I guess, five-time CMO now. That I often liken it um, jokingly to the sound of one hand clapping when marketing actually smashes its numbers, but sales mi misses theirs. Right. You know, because it's there's no joy in Mudville. Um, Mighty Casey has struck out, and uh, <laughs> everything else kind of sucks. Um, right. Because it, it really doesn't matter if, if uh, even volume quality, if those leads don't convert into close one business, especially in the time period under study. So it's kind of an endemic to the space, I suppose. Um. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it, of course, where, uh, you know, and then the finger gets pointed back and it's like, no, we're only responsible for generating the pipeline. It's like, no, you held a gun to my head to move it into pipeline. There's, you know, that, that back and forth goes, but, you know, and that was the biggest lesson that I feel like I learned uh, from 8x8 when I moved to Commvault, because now 
um, and, and, and there was an excellent year of uh, quality pipeline generated at 8x8. Unfortunately, when the pandemic hit, that whole industry took a huge hit. Yeah. Uh, uh, unified communications seemed to shoot up, and then all of a sudden it had this huge lull for, for the longest period. It seems to be recovering now again. Um, but I've been fortunate enough to be a part of organizations that have a, a, a need to have product rather than a nice to have. Um, and backup and recovery certainly didn't didn't um, uh, struggle in, 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 in during you know the, the, the I guess not so great economic times. But all that said, um, I, I still feel as a leader, my best year was uh, leading the teams at uh, at Commvault because now I could focus on the quality of the lead and making sure that. Um, the SDRs had their eyes focused on that. So it's easy for me to just put that in their commission plan, but to talk about it and to remind them, hey, you generated an opportunity with this company uh, uh, three, four months ago, and now it's in pipeline for $400,000. I mean, the way that lights up, um, uh, an SDR and motivates them to keep going and to, and to know that they're contributing to the bottom line of such a large enterprise organization. I mean, it's very, very motivating. It definitely is. Um, and it's good when you can have that connective tissue attached to kind of like any opportunity that's opened up. I'm curious to kind of peel the onion a little bit on your thoughts on qualification criteria, especially for um, an SDR group that one could make a very fair argument that if you get into the realm of Bant, Anim Champ, whatever, <clears throat> that on the opening conversations, when you're just starting out, when you're, again, cold calling or cold emailing, um, figuring out like whether somebody has budget, that's a mid, mid sales stage type of exercise, is it not? It's like you're reading my mind. So I believe in ant qualific qualification. Band is not something that's going to be unveiled till may maybe the third third call. At that point, maybe even the SE is joined. And I mean, it's for reasons that are completely out of everyone's control. The person that's on the other line doesn't even know how how much budget is being allocated to the project. And you know, those are the probing questions that come from a very seasoned. Uh, account executive and 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 it's you know it's it's you have to have very strong soft skills to be able to unveil that it's a very abrupt question that can make people tense so at that preliminary level I personally believe in volume and 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 then seeing if that quality isn't there how to work on that so I believe in setting an appointment with anyone and everyone uh, that, that's willing that that I, it expresses intent on having that next conversation. Absolutely. At the very least, they're going to learn about your technology, your company, and, and keep you in mind if things don't go, you know, it's a best case scenario, it's it, there's a 20% chance that deal is going to close to begin with. So that other 80%, I mean, how do you want to leave things off? So, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and arguably, that's a very marketing centric approach or way of thinking, as opposed to, and again, I, I don't mean to paint with a broad pejorative brush, but I think we've all experienced kind of like old school salespeople that are borderline order takers that just want fully qualified leads past their direction for them to kind of like roll up and close, um, which is kind of like a unicorn on the landscape, isn't it? It is. It is. And, and um, it's, it's how the, the, I don't even know if it's their fault because it's how the position ends up being sold to them. Sometimes you're going to have this, this, uh, this, fantastic specialist who understands all these tools that you don't need to and and they're going to sift through your accounts that you that have been handed over to you and and they're going to do all these magical things and and, and you're going to have this band ready qualified lead at your table and in some instances you will because marketing is that effective i mean uh, again I, I i truly believe this the difference between a good organization and a great organization is the, is 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 their uh, is the quality of their 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 marketing org and and how well of a well oiled machine and how well it's functioning and of course leadership as well, but um, yeah, account executives um, for a bevy of reasons uh, are are uh, dismissive of uh, leads that aren't ready to either uh, progress to close 
Um, they're definitely not going to put something in their pipeline, at least in my experience, that isn't uh, giving them a, a timeline. So that is, that's super important. And knowing that somebody has an active project and their contracts coming up uh, for the, the solutions, at least that I um, have been a part of is, is super important. Um, uh, thinking something. There, there was another, um, oh, right, right, right. So the account executives that operate today, at least in the, in the mid-market and um, enterprise space, um, Especially for the uh, you know UC and backup and recovery and and, and these uh, enterprise SaaS technologies, they are usually in the ten to fifteen years uh, of experience, and they themselves never had the luxury. You know they all have a story about it, similar to how I started uh, the, this uh, uh, call uh, about making hundreds of dials a day and. And, uh, you know, I don't want to accuse them of being uh, resentful, but they don't accept the inbound lead. They're like, that's something I can do. Um, and it, it just makes me chuckle because it's like, no, you can't. You, you, I've seen you send emails to me. I, I can only imagine how you would communicate with a prospect. So, But well, you yeah. said something really interesting before, and I, I kind of want to unpack it and dig into it deeper sure. for a lot of reasons. You said the good, the difference between a good and a great company is in their marketing. And I'm curious, especially given your role as having led sales development teams reporting into marketing, what role does sales development play in helping a company's overall marketing program? Not just the activities and the appointment level, but formulating message, building brand, classic marketing activities that believe it or not, rotate through sales development on the daily. Absolutely. I mean, the two departments that I was joint by the hip uh, in marketing were digital marketing and uh, marketing operations uh, and demand generation, of course. Um, so, you know, digital marketing is uh, going uh, gonna to work in conjun conjunction with a demand generation team of purchasing leads, uh, usually content syndication vendors or maybe even vendors that are specific to the industry. And these leads need to be tested and re they need to have real time feedback. And if I was over on the sales side, I would, you know, I can easily seeing, uh, see a sales leader say, okay, these didn't work, here you go. And not really emphasize the feedback. It's like, well, what didn't work? Was it the contact information? Was it the, um, the way that the leads were scored? Uh, you know, uh, the number of touch points that, that, do we need to revise the way that the lead scoring sort of takes place? Um, and, and not only that, you just hit, you just hit a great point. Um, if, if we're testing thousands and thousands of these leads and we're running it through our internal marketing um, automation program as far as uh, you know, uh, utilizing intent data and making sure that these are in fact the, the, the ideal customer personas that need to be reached out to. Um, where are we in that process as a marketing org? The best way to get that feedback is through your sales development team because it's, it's, it's so real time. And you know, again, you need somebody who's bought in um, uh, to this whole process for this communication to, to occur. But I, I, I mean, if you, if you can do this right, that's, it, it's a game changer. Well, they call it direct response for a reason, <laughs> you know, and I think sometimes the best way as a marketer that I found to learn, um, you know, the, the, I like to say it this way. A lot of marketers love to come up with campaigns, ideas, messaging, you know, taglines, what have you in isolation. And oftentimes those don't stand up to the, the scrutiny of the real world and how a product service or solution is going to be received. And one thing that's great about kind of like an SDR's world is objections are part of the deal, no matter what. <laughs> so, so you learn pretty quickly, like what those objections are, what, what people are responding well to messaging wise or what they're not. And ultimately being able to kind of like adjust or mold the clay on the fly. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, and, I, and I left out product marketing there. They're the ones who are, so, who are responsible for the, for the messaging component. And um, the question always is, you know, what messaging is resonating? What isn't? Um, 
And, uh, you know, that, that discussion, again, requires real time feedback um, from the reps, from their manager. Uh, and, you know, um, obviously with, with, with everything being automated and, and the emails being sent out um, uh, through these, um, these cloud communication tools like outreach and sales law, if you're able to track so many of these numbers like click rates and open rates and uh, the response rates. But again, the way these numbers are interpreted in marketing is, uh, no pun intended, very scientifically um, yeah. dissected. Uh, in sales, it's more about just volume of opportunities at bats, which is fine. That's how that's how companies close deals. But it's just it's just a different way of looking at it, I guess. Yeah, it really is. Um, sometimes I wonder too if if we don't get too lost in analysis paralysis, looking at numbers, especially in small conversion rate industries, which I think sales development is. You know, I, I I'm just not aware of a lot of people that have. 75% open rates and, you know, 59% response rates on any email campaign that they're sending out, regardless of sequence structure or content for that matter. Yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, other than the highest uh, open rate that at least I've, I'm aware of um, are, you know, obviously digital leads straight from the website or, or through chat uh, where somebody leaves there, you know, so, the, so there's a direct interaction uh, so that's an inbound lead. And even those were at 30, 35 percent. Um, so if, if, if the, these, these uh, other leads that are nurtured or even just through outbound prospecting, uh, those numbers are much lower. Usually in, you want that number to be around uh, 20 percent um, uh, in terms of uh, interaction, because uh, that lets you know that you're at least uh, prompting response. Um, but but yeah yeah there's there's nothing that that's that's above that that threshold that I, that that I've seen. Well, you know it's funny. I think um, going over to the marketing side of the house again, just to draw a, a relevant example that it, I'm not aware of how many people make this correlation. But most marketers, if you just take the public website of most organizations, especially SaaS, there's reams of data, and it's been this way for frankly, the last decade, maybe more, that the average website for a SaaS-based B2B business converts visitors into some sort of intent action form fill at usually around a percent, percent and a half rate. Right, yes. Which um, flipped around, it means like 98% of people are going away with doing nothing every time they visit your website, right? <laughs> absolutely. When that chat bot appears, when that prompt comes up, um, that's exactly it. It's less than 2% of people who have, who are uh, shown that or are on your website actually turn into a lead. And even, and it's even a smaller percentage after that, because they could have just filled out, um, you know, faulty information to, to try to get to the next step of whatever it is that they were trying to download. So yeah, that, that number is, is a very, very small percentage. Well, and I think about it from the, the standpoint of like, I don't think anyone gets super excited or happy when we see 1% conversion rates in sales development land. And yet it's an outbound motion. Again, it's coming cold. <laughs> Theoretically, we're an in interruption on, on every person's day that we reach out to. And, and yet exceeding like normal percentages for a slightly similar and albeit not that correlated, but similar activity has always struck me as like very interesting. Um, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. I mean, if you have a team of reps, and I, I don't know how this is going to come across, but if you have reps that are um, good storytellers, um, because that's what resonates on on yeah. on every call. It, you know, everything else aside, what the what. The, person on the other line is going to walk away from is whether or not, you know, is, is whether or not they, they, they had a good conversation. And that's how I always used to recruit SDRs. I, I didn't necessarily worry too much about the experience. I, I mean, I wanted to know that they face rejection and that's not something that they're going to be fearful of. But I, you know, when, when you ask a, a potential SDR or an SDR to tell, tell you about themselves and they're able to give you a colorful story, 
that's somebody I know I can train and to be very, very good at this. Because if you're not afraid of rejection and you're able to tell a good story, people are going to want to listen to you. And, and you can leave, and this is, a, if it's a sought after product, which most likely it will be in the SaaS space, um, you're going to be able to progress that opportunity. But uh, yeah, I think that's critical to having a high functioning, high performing SDR team. It's so funny. We, we've had a number of guests on recently on the podcast who really, um, you know, authors that have written books about storytelling and, and the effectiveness of, of such in sales. And what you're saying is perfectly consistent with, with their points, which is that essentially the meta point is that human beings who roam the planet and evolved from caves um, pretty much are hardwired to find stories to be the most effective forms of communication. Couldn't agree more. I mean, um, I have a stat up here. Uh, after a presentation, 63% of attendees remember stories Five percent remember statistics. Yeah. So, you know, we get caught up in 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 stats and metrics and all of these other things. But did you say something that resonated with that person? I mean, it's it's uh, you know not to get into neuroscience or anything, but it's going uh, to increase serotonin and endorphins is, is contingent on having a good interaction, and that uh, is, you know depends on whether or not you can relate. <laughs> Well, and as a practitioner and as a manager and as a leader, someone you, you gave us kind of an insight into that was something that you selected for in the hiring process. Tell me a little bit more about how you would kind of like orient your teams towards improving story craft, using stories um, in their outreach, capitalizing on their ability to tell good stories. Um, sure. It's um you know, after you're able to get past that initial um, sort of uh, uh, 30 seconds to a minute, which is probably the most difficult part to navigate in a phone call, and this person's now awarded you uh, probably four or five minutes of their time to at least listen to what you have to say. Mm -hmm. um, for starters, you have to recognize when that is. Um, you know, you, you sort of have to gauge through intuition and, and just instincts whether or not this is somebody who's going to be, you know, you can, you, you can gauge if somebody's in such a rush and they're just upset they even picked up the phone to listen to your voice, right? That's not going to really go anywhere. But if you're, if you're, um, if you play the numbers game right, you're obviously going to come across somebody who just might want to have a conversation. Yeah. And what I always recommended, because I, I'm, you know, uh, prone to uh, statistics and the volume game, is that that's when you practice your pitch. Um, that's when you have those, um, uh, those conversations. It's not to set an appointment. You don't want anything from the person. You're just having a conversation and you're telling them what you do. And then if, and then at some point in that conversation, you turn it around and let them talk about themselves because that's what, you know, that's, that's, what's going to, uh, progress as far as a conversation, but as far as being a good storyteller, I mean, I always encourage all team members to read self-help books, learn more about yourself, obviously, um, uh, be, you know, have compassion on the other line, just because somebody was upset at you doesn't mean it has anything to do with you. So you don't take things personally. Um, being in a good mood, I, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know how PC it is to tell people to work out, but I think that really helps being in a good mood to start your day, especially in this role. It's a very mentally uh, draining sort of a position. So to, to remain in a good mood, um, you, you have to be, you know, active and, 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 and all sorts of things. But going back to the storytelling piece, I just think as long as you practice your pitch, don't make it the same one. I believe in call guides, not call scripts. Um, if, you, if, you, if you come in sounding like a robot, it, it doesn't, you know, uh, another reason why I think uh, SDRs will prevail over AIs. <laughs> um you want to come across naturals but yeah that's that's usually what i what i used to preach and and you know um uh sdrs have a tendency especially the top performers as soon as they get off a call they just start talking about it to everybody i encourage that so much just you know you don't necessarily have to be on the phone to have a um uh, to have a good conversation you can have it around you sometimes that's what got some of the top performers going to have conversations around them um, which was, you know, really looked down upon when I started. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that you made a really interesting point and one that, that I always chuckle at. 
I, I like the distinction of guides, not scripts, because isn't one of the worst things that we could level at the feet of any SDR is that they sounded scripted. <laughs> like one of the worst criticisms we could provide. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yet every SDR I know has a, has a call script. Um, yeah. And, you know, that in my position, that, that, that's, that's a requirement to be coming in and, and, and creating a call script. And don't get me wrong, there's, you know, there's a science behind that uh, piece of it, too. There's an intro, there's, a, there's a, a body, there's a conclusion, you have to consolidate, uh, you have to avoid buyer's remorse. There's, there's a lot of things that you have to know, navigate throughout a phone call and know where you are. And, um, but at the same time, if you have bullet points, if you know the history of your company, if you've done the right research on the other company, uh, if you have a relatable experience that you can, you can convey to the client, you're going to, you're going to have a good conversation. The goal is to have meaningful interactions and good conversations. As long as you do that, I think you can be successful as an SDR. Do you have a preference while we're deconstructing, you know, your average cold call, do you have a preference on... <clears throat> structuring questions of the prospect up at the front of the call or later on um, in a perfect world as you think through kind of call components? That's a great question. Um, on, okay, so the only instance in where I, where I see it being at the, at the beginning of a call is when you're kind of, you know, the response is, oh yeah, I was waiting for you to call. And that's like one in a million. Um, because if you start asking a bunch of questions without building any rapport, it's going to, uh, it's going to throw off, uh, the conversation flow, even if it's an inbound lead. Mm. Um, now that said, I don't necessarily believe in having it at the end either. I, I believe in sprinkling it in, yeah. um, throughout the conversation. Um, and, and, you know, there's usually three or four very essential, con uh, topics, you know, who's your current provider and, uh, you know, what's your feedback there? And, you know, obviously you want to unveil any, any pain that the, that the client's expressing. And, you know, you never want to treat them like they, they don't know. After 30 seconds, they know what this, converse, this call is about and they, that, that, you're, that you're obviously calling for a reason. Yeah. So the, the, the more it progresses, the more you can throw your questions in, listen, and then, and then find times to do that. But as far as a close goes that's a little bit different so yeah. closing for next steps i don't even mind if an sdr says it within the first minute and a half and it's a very soft close uh, which goes somewhere along the lines of um you know and obviously if this conversation progresses uh we can go ahead and uh set up next steps if that, if, if that makes sense but let me let me uh let me pull back for a minute you know, yeah. uh, like, uh, like uh, something along those lines. But if, you, if you're able to get away with doing that in the beginning, you sort of give yourself a, a chance to close at the, at the end without any real pressure. I think that's true. Um, yeah, it's interesting. There's a lot of different ways to structure kind of um, any cold call for success. And, and I'm, I'm a big fan of experimentation, to be honest with you, and, and kind of learning, because it also has a lot to do with the style and the tone and the, the strengths of the caller um, themselves, <clears throat> which we oftentimes do under, in, under index on. Um, one of the things I'd love to pivot over to is talking a little bit about your current consultancy. So you've taken quite a lot of like work product insights, leadership that you've had with you know, very <clears throat> name brand reputable companies and success metrics with them in running their sales development programs. Tell me a little bit about um, you know, your consultancy now, kind of clients you're, you, you're used to and what kind of experiences you've seen now being a consultant side of the house? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, walking away from my previous uh, position, it wasn't the easiest thing in the world, but I, I never really uh, was, a, was um, in a position in my career to, to, to start consulting and it, it started happening while I was working. Um, I, I was starting to receive requests from, from various uh, network marketing agencies. And so when I left Commvault and I started my consultancy, it actually started with um, the technology of the uh, industries that I had worked in. And it was in investors just trying to get a better understanding of um, uh, how the industries operate and, and sort of what the competitive landscape looks like and the product roadmap. And, you know, COVID changed a lot when it came to uh, some of these technologies. They just went into hyperdrive. But eventually, and I'm starting to see it a lot more now, 
I'm getting more and more consultations uh, with companies that are interested in learning about org structures and um, sort of the relationship between marketing and sales um, and, and, and how the, the, the two departments sort of operate and you know what my findings was, I always refer to my department uh, or the sales development teams as, as, as a bridge between marketing and sales. Um, so um, at this point, um, uh, the last, I don't know, t t eight to 10 consults that I've had have all been around organizational structure, but also um, uh, specific to marketing as well as uh, uh, a little bit of AI and generative AI that's been sprinkled in there as well. A lot of people are very curious too, I think, wanting to dip their toes in the water or, you know, figure out ways to get more both effective and efficient, right? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, um, uh, I, I, and, and I always try to uh, uh, give them, you know, as much information as far as what best in class is, but then at the same time, you know, there's, there, there's humility as to, uh, that needs to be taken into place. These, these, not all of these companies know what they're doing all the time, right? Sure. They, they themselves are going to have bad quarters where they're going to just think that changing everything is the answer. Mm -hmm. And, 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 you know, when that happens, all of a sudden, all those best practices go out the window and it's, uh, it's like, what's the new plan? And, you know, this is with regards to where, you know, we talked about sales development, it could be, okay, now it needs to report to sales because it's not working. Uh, this is just as an example in, into marketing or, um, you know, the comp plans need to completely change or the number of AEs need to increase in this area versus that area. So these are topics that are always being discussed. But, but yeah, definitely what I gather from these uh, calls is um, uh, these investors and, 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 and business owners, what they're trying to understand is what are the best practices by the, uh, administered by, by enterprise organizations that have been successful for you know, uh, a quarter of a century at this point. Yeah, it's, it's almost like um, once you hit diminishing returns on any activity, Boy, oh boy, everybody wants to change overnight, you know? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> that must be a fascinating kind of like uh, passenger seat or actually driver's seat, I guess, um, as a consultant. It is, it is. You know, um, I, I took a lot of pride in the fact that I uh, had been a rep for many years and I customer faced in every role that I was ever in. Uh, when I moved into leadership um, uh, and you know, um, I never wanted to be the same type of leader that at least I reported to who used to never customer face yet do all these sort of role plays. And it's like, you haven't been on the phones for 10 years, you know, <laughs> things have changed a little bit. Yeah. Um, so, but, but sorry, not to sound like a hypocrite, I ended up in that seat and um, it's very difficult to, to, to do anything but demonstrate a few cold calls here and there. So with this consultancy, I've gotten a chance to customer face again, and it's been it's been great. That's cool. That's great. Um, well, I feel like we've touched on so much different ground and bounced in a, a number of uh, what I found to be super insightful directions. <clears throat> One of the things that I think would be helpful uh, for our listeners out there, for anyone that wants to get a hold of you, um, potentially even to investigate using your services, or just continue the conversation that we started here today, where should they go? I'm sure you can uh, hit me up on LinkedIn, Saroj Khan. Um, you can uh, always reach out to me uh, uh, via email. I don't have too many social media channels, but um, uh, maybe this is, this is the, the right time for me to sort of increase my own uh, accessibility. Uh, but yeah, saroj.khan778 at Gmail, or you can just hit me up on LinkedIn. I'm very responsive, and this is, you know, my, one of my favorite topics to discuss. So again, I really appreciate that. You bet. It's been my pleasure.